Hey, what is up everybody? It's Animac here for Anime Uproar and in this video I will be breaking down the quirks and special abilities of all 20 class 1A students including all of their updates and upgrades as of the final arc in the MHA manga. One of the very first MHA videos that we did here on the channel was a video explaining all the quirks in class 1A. But that was over 5 years ago and things have changed drastically. Some quirks have changed completely, others have become much stronger, and others still turned out to be quirks that were stolen from other people. And we even got the long-awaited face reveals for Toru Hagakure and Mezo Shoji. So yeah, there is a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. You guys know how this works. If you enjoy our videos and you want to support us, leave a quick like and comment right now. It only takes you a second, but it helps us out with that YouTube algorithm. And if you're one of the over 50% of people who watch our videos regularly but haven't taken the time to subscribe yet, do me a big favor and make this the video that you subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications. Subscribing on YouTube is completely free, it's literally just a click or two, but it's actually very important. Finally, this video will contain all the latest spoilers about the 20 quirks in Class 1A, so please proceed with caution, you have been warned. First up, let's talk about the student who sits in seat number one, Yuga Aoyama, also known as the shining hero Can't Stop Twinkling, and his quirk Naval Laser. Although, spoiler alert, it's not actually his quirk. Naval Laser is an emitter type quirk that enables its user to fire twinkly but powerful laser beams from his belly button. The laser beam is quite strong, and we've seen it easily destroying hard surfaces like metal and concrete. That said, this is a shonen series, so we've also seen the lasers being aimed directly at Yuga's opponents, and yet those who were attacked managed to survive. They weren't like game over on the spot or anything like that. Yuga does have some ability to control the power of his laser attacks. For example, his ultimate move called Supernova requires him to charge his naval laser for at least 5 seconds. And after that he can release a significantly more powerful laser attack than the attacks he normally uses. The quirk can be pretty versatile if you know how to control it. It is able to attack from short, mid and long range distances and the user can also use the laser to fly through the air by aiming the laser into the ground or another surface. The user can also alter the shape and size of the laser beam that is being used. It can be extremely thin or it can be as wide as an entire person. And it can even be turned into a blade of light which can then be used as a saber like weapon. In fact, this is one of Yuga's ultimate moves called Naval Saber. This quirk can also be very practical in dark environments because the bright light it produces can be used to light up the surrounding area. It can even be used to send a powerful signal into the air as a way to inform your allies of your location or as a way to lure your enemies into a trap. But even though Naval Laser is a pretty powerful and versatile quirk, it also has some serious drawbacks, especially for Yuga in particular. As we learned in chapter 336 of the manga, Yuga Aoyama was actually born quirkless, meaning that Naval Laser did not originally belong to him. Naval Laser was actually given to Yuga by the arch villain All For One himself, after Yuga's parents made a deal with All For One because they didn't want their son to be a quirkless outcast. As we know, All For One has the ability to steal the quirks of others and transfer them either to himself or to other people and Naval Laser is a stolen quirk that he transferred to Yuga. However, Yuga's body had a tough time adapting to the sudden appearance of a quirk, and so the power of Naval Laser began accidentally leaking out of his belly button even if he didn't want it to. As a result, he had to start wearing a special belt called the Sparkle Belt at all times in order to prevent his Naval Laser from bursting out uncontrollably. On top of being difficult to control, Naval Laser also has limitations in terms of how much of its power can be used at once. If Yuga continues using the laser for more than a second, his insides can become damaged and he can even lose control of his bowels. Initially, he is only able to fire the laser from one place in his body, his belly button. As a result, he was always forced to face his opponent directly when engaging in battle and he was vulnerable to attacks from behind and from the sides. Yuga eventually acquires a hero costume that allows him to channel the power of Naval Laser and send it to other parts of his body. 
which then enables him to launch laser beams from his knees and shoulders, as well as from his belly button. In seat number two, we have Mina Ashido, also known as Pinky, and her quirk, Acid. Now, Mina has a very unique appearance. Her skin is pinkish, she has horns on her head, and the white of her eyes is actually black. This may lead some to conclude that she has a mutant type quirk, but her quirk is actually classified as emitter. That's because her quirk is not a byproduct of a mutation. Rather, her unique appearance is in part a byproduct of her quirk. It's a bit confusing, but we gotta just roll with it. The quirk classifications are not as precise as people might think. Acid is a medium range quirk that enables its user to generate an acid-like corrosive substance from her skin. Mina can produce the acid from any part of her skin and she is able to manipulate the quantity and the trajectory of the fluid. Her acid is quite strong and it can corrode even strong substances like metals. She herself is resistant to the effects of her quirk so her acid will not harm her. However, if Mina overuses her quirk and produces too much acid in a short period of time, her skin will eventually stop being resistant and she will hurt herself. Mina is aware of this limitation and she has trained hard to make her skin more durable. She's also worked tirelessly to control her quirk so as not to accidentally harm anyone. That said, accidents can still happen, so she has to wear a special acid-proof hero costume so as not to accidentally burn her own clothes off in the middle of a battle. As Mina's training progresses, she is able to control the thickness and texture of her acid. This means that she can make it more or less harmful to other living beings depending on what her objective is. And she can use it for other interesting purposes such as creating a thick defensive barrier, or using it to climb walls by having the acid burn holes into the walls that she could then grab onto. She can even release acid from her feet and make the floor slippery, which then increases her maneuverability because it allows her to skate or glide across the floor. She can also quickly burn holes in walls and floors in order to gain access to a particular location. And she can even use an ultimate move called Acid Man, which essentially allows her to coat her entire body inside a thick acidic armor. Even though Mina's quirk is a pretty simple concept, producing acid from your skin, the more we learn about it, the more we realize how useful and versatile this quirk can be. It has offensive capabilities, defensive capabilities, and it helps with maneuverability and infiltration. And of course, part of the reason why this quirk turned out to be so strong and versatile is Mina herself. She is fiercely committed to her training, and hard work pays off. In seat number three, we have Tsuyu Asui, also known as the rainy season hero, Froppy. The name of her quirk is Frog, and it is actually classified as a mutant type quirk. Tsuyu was born as a human with the biological traits of a frog, including incredibly strong legs that allow her to hop through the air, the ability to cling to walls, the ability to secrete mucus that produces various different effects including paralysis, a strong and extremely long frog-like tongue that can stretch for like 20 meters, the ability to swim faster than any human, the ability to use camouflage, and so on. Basically, Tsuyu has the ability to do everything that a frog is able to do, although to be fair, she can actually use the abilities of a variety of different species of frog. She further enhances her ability through vigorous physical training. So unlike Mina, whose quirk is the ability to produce acid and then this quirk alters her physical appearance as her body adapts to the quirk itself, Tsuyu's frog-like anatomy is what gives her all of her abilities in the first place. So her actual anatomy is her quirk. That is why it's a mutant type quirk. As you'd expect from someone who has the biological makeup of a frog, Tsuyu is adversely affected by extreme cold temperatures because frogs are cold-blooded and they cannot function in extremely cold conditions. Along with extreme cold, Tsuyu also isn't good with extreme heat because frogs are aquatic creatures so they can't function in excessively hot and dry conditions. But despite the quirk's weaknesses and limitations, frog is one of the most versatile quirks in MHA. It allows for superhuman speed, agility, and maneuverability. In fact, Deku taught himself to release Black Whip from his mouth in the same way that Tsuyu releases her giant tongue. And he calls this move Froppy Style as an homage to Tsuyu. 
In seat number four is class representative Tenya Ida, aka Turbo Hero Ingenium, and his quirk, Engine. Engine is another mutant type quirk because Tenya was actually born with engine parts inside the calves of his legs. And this allows Tenya to move extremely quickly and reach incredible speeds. Now, I'm no mechanic or biologist, but I guess having mufflers on your calves would make you a really fast runner. I'm sure that's how human anatomy and mechanical engines work, so we don't need to question it. Needless to say, having the ability to achieve super speed is very useful in battle, and it is also useful if you need to get somewhere in a hurry, like if someone needs to be rescued and time is of the essence. And let's be real, super speed is also useful if you just want to run away from a stronger enemy before they can take you out. I mean, that is literally the Joestar family secret technique, as explained by the greatest Jojo of all time, Joseph Joestar. Along with speed, Tenya's quirk also gives him superhuman leg strength, which allows him to deliver overpowered kicks that are strong enough to destroy even hard substances like metal. A lot of these guys can just crush metal, metal is nothing in the world of MHA. Just like a car engine, Tenya's engine quirk has different gears, and he can switch between those gears depending on how much speed and power he requires at any given time. In terms of those mufflers that are sticking out of Tenya's legs, they can actually be forcibly removed, which is an extremely painful procedure. But if they are removed, new ones will eventually grow in their place, and these new ones will be even more powerful if the user continues to push his limits through rigorous training, thereby forcing them to adapt to these new levels of power. Just like real engines, Tenya's engines require some sort of fuel to function, and for Tenya, this fuel is actually orange juice. He needs to consume enough orange juice to use his quirk properly, and if he doesn't, his quirk will eventually progressively get weaker and then stop working altogether. Tenya must also refrain from consuming carbonated drinks like soda, because carbonated drinks cause his engines to stall. On top of that, Tenya has to make sure that no one blocks or clogs his mufflers in any way, because this would hinder his ability to use his quirk. Tenya's older brother Tensei also possesses the same quirk, although his engines are on his elbows rather than on his calves. The quirk seems to function in essentially the same way for both brothers. Both can use the same ultimate move known as Recipro Burst, which allows the user to produce a brief but massive burst of speed. This burst will last for only about 10 seconds, and after the end of the 10 seconds, the engines will be incapacitated for a while. But if used wisely, those 10 seconds can give Tenya an important upper hand over his opponent in battle. Later on, after removing and regenerating his mufflers, Tenya is able to unlock a move called Recipro Turbo, which allows him to drastically increase his speed for 10 whole minutes rather than just 10 seconds. Recipro Turbo is even faster than other moves like Recipro Burst and Recipro Extend, and it is said to even surpass Gran Torino's quirk Jet when it comes to speed. In seat number 5, we have Ochako Uraraka, aka Uraviti, and her emitter type quirk, Zero Uravity, I mean Zero Gravity. Ochako has these little pads on the tips of her fingers, and her quirk allows her to essentially remove the gravity around anything or anyone that she touches with those pads. As the quirk's name suggests, the person or object that Ochako touches instantly begins to experience zero gravity and becomes weightless. As long as she touches something that is under 3 tons in weight, Ochako can make it float in midair. And she can choose to activate or cancel out the effects of her quirk by pressing her fingertips together. At first, every time Ochako used the quirk on herself in order to make herself float, she would become nauseous and vomit. She trained hard in zero gravity conditions in order to reduce this side effect, and she has been successful in managing it over time. She also trained hard to learn to control her quirk and to make good use of it during fights and evacuations. Ochako has trained martial arts so that she can use them alongside her quirk in order to be more effective in combat. And if she can get close enough to touch her target and make the opponent float, this is usually very effective in terms of disorienting the opponent and taking them out of the battle. That said, Ochako's quirk does require her to make direct physical contact with her target, which means that she usually needs to get up close and personal to her opponent. 
So, she often has to put herself in dangerous situations in order to touch her target directly. As a result, villains with good long-range quirks have a decisive advantage over Ochako. But, Ochako is able to make good use of the battlefield itself. Like for example, she can touch a bunch of heavy rubble, float it up into the air, and then drop it down on potential opponents. This skill can also be used to rescue people who might be stuck beneath debris and rubble by lifting it up and then evacuating them to safety. Ochako is a great team player, and her quirk can be used very effectively in conjunction with other quirks. For instance, she can make herself and her allies float, and if anyone has a quirk that can propel them forward, they will effectively be flying at great speeds thanks to zero gravity. Another example of her team game is the move Meteor Fafrotskis, in which Ochako uses zero gravity on herself, Tsuyu, and a bunch of debris. Tsuyu then uses her tongue to launch the floating debris directly at their opponents on the ground, while the two of them are still safely in the air. Ochako has a whole bunch of named ultimate moves, but they all revolve around making either people or objects or both float in some way. In seat number 6, we have Mashirao Ojiro, whose hero name is Tailman, and whose quirk name is simple and to the point, Tail. Ojiro's quirk is a mutant type quirk that grants its user a long and powerful tail that can be used as an additional appendage on his body. The tail itself is extremely strong. It can break metal objects, it can support Ojiro's entire weight if he wants to hang by his tail, and it can be used as an effective way to restrain opponents by wrapping the tail around them. Ojiro has worked very hard to make his tail stronger and more resilient through training. For example, he practiced hitting Kirishima's hardened body over and over again in order to increase the strength and durability of his tail. It is important to note that Ojiro is a trained martial artist, and he uses his mastery of martial arts in combination with his quirk to make himself a powerful and effective fighter. Not only is Ojiro able to use his tail as an additional appendage with which to attack an opponent, but he can also use it to propel himself in various directions. He can use it to suspend himself from elongated structures like pipes by wrapping his tail around them, and so on. Tail has two named ultimate moves. The first is Tornado Tail Dance, which involves Ojiro launching himself at an opponent, spinning in the air, and smashing everything around him with his powerful tail. The second is Swamp Smack Spin, which involves Ojiro stretching out his tail and spinning horizontally, allowing him to drive away everything and everyone around him. Since tail is a permanent part of Ojiro's body, it can at times restrict his movements when compared to other humans. I mean, imagine having to sleep every night with that massive tail permanently attached to you. That would definitely take some getting used to. And of course, because this quirk is just an additional physical appendage, tail is vulnerable to all forms of potential physical damage, just like a normal leg or arm. Seat number 7 is occupied by the one and only Denki Kaminari, also known as the stun gun hero Charge Bolt. Kaminari has an emitter type quirk called Electrification, and it enables him to charge himself up with electricity and then release that electricity from his body to either attack an opponent or defend himself from an opponent's attack. Using the quirk will produce both electricity and light, and it has the ability to paralyze those who come into direct contact with that electric energy. In the real world, a strong electric discharge can of course kill people, but since this is shonen, Kaminari's quirk just leaves his targets paralyzed. Initially, Kaminari doesn't really have control over the electricity that he releases, and so everyone who is close to him when he uses his quirk is affected by it, including both allies and enemies. But, thanks to the work of the UA support department, Kaminari's hero costume was eventually equipped with sharpshooting gear. Created by Mei Hatsume and Power Loader, sharpshooting gear is a support item that allows Kaminari to actually aim his electric discharges so that they won't negatively affect the people around him who are not his targets. Kaminari has a device on his right arm which allows him to fire off discs in whichever direction he pleases. These discs will then stick to the point of impact, and as long as Kaminari remains within 10 meters of the intended target, the electricity that he discharges will be drawn directly to the disc and surge towards it in a straight line instead of discharging wildly all around him. He can even target multiple points of impact by using a dial on his shooter and calculating the locations of the various points of impact using his special glasses. 
It's all really cool, complicated tech stuff, very cyberpunk. In addition to attacking and defending with his quirk, Kaminari can use electric discharges to power electronic devices, making him a great friend to have around when you forget your smartphone charger. But even though electrification is both powerful and useful, it also has some significant drawbacks. At its core, electrification is a close-range quirk, and the further away you try to discharge it, the less effective it becomes. On top of that, there is a limit to how much electric power Kaminari can actually discharge. If he surpasses his limit, he will essentially short-circuit his own brain, and this turns him into a useless, derpy mess for about an hour. During that one-hour period, he can't really use his quirk to do much of anything, so he becomes nothing but dead weight on the battlefield. And while his derpy mode is a great meme, it is a very serious setback in battle. If he's not careful, this weakness could jeopardize Kaminari's life and the life of his allies if it happened at the wrong time. Kaminari's quirk will also be rendered ineffective whenever he runs into materials that don't conduct electricity. So, for example, if Kaminari tried to fight Luffy, he would be completely wrecked. Electrification has a number of ultimate moves, including indiscriminate shock 1.3 million volts, which involves Kaminari discharging a bunch of electricity all around him and shocking everyone that is close to him. This is obviously a useful attack when you are surrounded by enemies, but it is less useful when you are also in the vicinity of your own allies. He can also use indiscriminate shock 2 million volts, which is essentially the same as the previous ultimate move, but the voltage is higher. Due to the higher voltage, this attack is more likely to short-circuit Kaminari's brain. Finally, Kaminari has a move called Target Electo. This move refers to Kaminari using his sharpshooting gear to fire off a powerful charge of electricity towards his target in a straight line. Seat number 8 belongs to our boy Eijiro Kirishima, aka the sturdy hero, Red Riot. The name of his quirk is Hardening. It's a transformation type quirk, and it allows him to harden his body, either all of it or a select part that he chooses, such as an arm. Once hardened, Kirishima's body becomes both tough and sharp, so it can be used both defensively and offensively. In terms of defense, Kirishima's hardened body can withstand explosions, falling rubble, and even bullets without suffering damage. In terms of offense, Kirishima's hardening greatly increases the power of his attacks, and he is able to destroy powerful objects like metal with a single blow. Again, all of these guys can just crush metal. Metal doesn't stand a chance. In addition, Kirishima can actually increase the strength of his quirk by training it. And that is exactly what he does during his training sessions with Ojiro. The more damage Kirishima takes on in training, the more his hardening can adapt and become even more durable in the future. Hardening first manifested when Kirishima was 3 years old, and initially it was a much weaker quirk than it is now. Kirishima's ability to harden his body to the extent that he is able to now is a result of intense training and hard work. It's not just natural talent. But with all of that said, hardening isn't without limits, and if Kirishima takes on enough damage, his hardening will eventually wear off. So if he's facing a particularly powerful and relentless opponent, his quirk could give out and he could be defeated. Needless to say, hardening is a short-range quirk with no long-range capabilities. The user must get up close and personal with his opponent in order to use the quirk for offensive purposes. Although the defensive aspects of hardening can still be used against an opponent with long-range attacks. Finally, even though hardening protects Kirishima from nearly all physical damage, his body will still feel the effects of extreme hot or extreme cold if he's facing an opponent with like a fire-based quirk or an ice-based quirk. In such situations, his body will be immune to physical damage, but it could still be vulnerable to other side effects that come with being exposed to extreme cold or heat. Kirishima has a number of ultimate moves, including Red Counter, which allows him to withstand a close-range attack from an opponent and then immediately counterattack with a hardened punch. There's also Red Riot Unbreakable, which allows Kirishima to reach the absolute maximum of his hardening abilities. His entire body becomes rugged and hard, almost like a jagged cliff. In this form, Kirishima is practically indestructible but he can only maintain it for about 30 or 40 seconds. Nevertheless, even if he is unable to end the fight while in this form and he is forced to return to normal, Kirishima can still eventually come back and keep fighting, which is an ability that he demonstrated in his fight against Rappa. 
Kirishima's third named ultimate move is Red Gauntlet, which involves Kirishima rushing the enemy and smashing them with a single overpowered punch. On top of being a great quirk for hand-to-hand -hand combat, hardening is also very useful for a hero to have in evacuation situations. That's because the user can smash through rubble in order to get to civilians who may be stuck inside and then rescue them. He can also use this hardened body as a human shield in order to protect innocent civilians from potential attacks. Next up, we have Koji Koda, aka the petting hero Anima, who sits in seat number 9. He has an emitter type quirk called Anivoice, and this quirk enables him to communicate directly with animals and also to tell them what to do. The animals will then obey his orders and do his bidding. He doesn't seem to be able to have a complex conversation with an animal like he would with another human, but he can definitely give information to animals and they can also pass information back to him. Koda's quirk allows him to make use of all sorts of animals, from tiny insects to large beasts and from burrowing rodents to high flying birds. We don't know if animals have the power to disobey Koda, but so far they have always complied with his orders. This could be because they genuinely like Koda because he is very nice to them and he is clearly an animal lover, or it could just be that the quirk actually compels them to obey. Even though humans are technically also animals, Anna Voice does not work on humans. It also doesn't work on any artificial creatures such as robots. Because the quirk works on the basis of sound, if Koda is unable to speak for whatever reason, the quirk will not work. Furthermore, if another quirk can produce a loud noise that drowns out and a voice, then it will also lose its effectiveness. Like many others, Koda is able to make his quirk stronger through training. In particular, he is able to do vocal cord exercises that increase the range of his quirk, making it possible to control animals that are far away from him and not just animals that are like right beside him. He also uses a voice amplifier as part of his hero costume, which also increases the range of his quirk. At first, Koda didn't want to use his quirk on insects because he was afraid of them, but he has been working through that fear. In chapter 372, Koda undergoes a bit of a transformation. He grows horns on his head, which is something that his mother had told him would happen when he reaches maturity. And after that occurs, his quirk becomes more powerful and its range increases even further. Koda has two named ultimate moves, including Hitchcock Birds, which involves Koda summoning a swarm of birds and using them against an opponent. The name of this move is a reference to the movie The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. His second ultimate move is Bugging Out, which involves Koda summoning bugs and insects and then getting them to swarm his opponent. Seat number 10 belongs to Rikido Sato, also known as the sweets hero Sugar Man. The name of his quirk is Sugar Rush, it is an emitter type quirk, and it enables its user to suddenly become 5 times stronger than he is normally. This lasts for a period of 3 minutes for every 10 grams of sugar that he consumes. The quirk is pretty straightforward. It is a temporary power boost fueled by unhealthy amounts of sugar. And Sato must consume this sugar before his quirk will activate. If he doesn't have access to sugar, Sato cannot use his quirk, and there is also a drawback to using it. After using Sugar Rush, Sato will experience a sugar crash, and this will result in the lowering of his cognitive ability and intelligence, as well as sluggishness and a lack of energy. Sato is a close range fighter, and he uses his quirk to punch his way through opponents while the effects of the sugar last. His hero costume includes a belt that holds sugar containers which he can then consume when he needs them. His only named move is also called Sugar Rush, and it's basically just him consuming sugar and then rushing his opponent and punching him over and over again and screaming <laughs> But yeah, he's basically a JoJo's character. In seat number 11, we have Mezo Shoji, also known as the Tentacle Hero Tentacle, a character who was a mystery for most of the series, but who finally got some excellent character development in the final arc. Shoji has a mutant type quirk called Dupliar. He was born with fleshy arm-like tentacles attached to his body. And his quirk enables him to essentially duplicate parts of his body and produce them on these tentacles. The duplicate body parts are improved versions of the originals, which allows Shoji to increase both his strength and his senses when using the quirk. If any of the replicated parts are damaged or cut off, 
Shoji can still replace them again later. That said, he will feel pain when the duplicated body parts are injured and it takes some time to heal those injuries. Shoji is able to make his duplicate body parts stronger and more effective through training and his quirk is actually very versatile with many diverse uses. His ability to produce high-powered eyes and ears in various places on his body make him great at gathering intel, spying and stakeouts. He can create many artificial arms on his body, which he can then use to deliver a barrage of incredibly strong punches on his opponent. He can also use his arms and tentacles to create a protective cocoon around people and then carry them out of harm's way, which has got great ability to have when evacuating civilians. Because of the webbed design of his dupli arms, Shoji can even use them to glide through the air for a brief period of time by spreading them open as if they were a large pair of wings. Shoji has several named ultimate moves, including Octoblow, which allows him to create multiple arms at once and then unleash an array of fast-paced and overpowered punches at his opponent. He also has a move called Octo Searcher, which allows him to create multiple artificial eyes and ears throughout his body in order to gather as much intel as possible within a short period of time. And in the final arc of the story, Shoji revealed a new move called Octo Spansion which allows him to transform his tentacle-like arm into a gigantic fist that he can then use to deliver a super-powered punch to his opponent. Due to the mutant-type nature of his quirk, Shoji has an unconventional physical appearance. Along with his unique tentacle-like arms, he also has a face that looks different from what an average human face looks like. Initially, Shoji kind of implied that he wore a mask all the time because his face was particularly grotesque or disturbing, but that is not actually the case. When he does finally reveal his face, we see that although it looks elongated and unconventional, his face is by no means ugly or disturbing. He does however have multiple scars across his face, which were given to him by bullies who attacked him just because he had a mutant type quirk. Shoji had an extremely tough childhood and he faced serious hardship because of the nature of his quirk, but he persevered and became a truly impressive and admirable hero. Seat number 12 is occupied by Kyoka Jiro, also known as the Hearing Hero Earphone Jack. She has a mutant type quirk which is also called Earphone Jack. Jiro's earlobes are basically long earphone cables that she can control and manipulate. There is a jack at the end of each earlobe and Jiro is able to plug these jacks into various objects including electronic equipment. If she channels the vibration of her heartbeats into her cable-like earlobes, she can actually damage the objects that she comes into contact with. She can also use the earlobes to hear what's happening on the other side of large walls, so kind of like Shoji, she is well suited for scouting and reconnaissance missions. Although amazing for support and spying because it can detect enemy movements through vibrations and things of that nature, Earphone Jack's natural offensive abilities are limited compared to some of the other quirks that we've covered. But with that said, Jiro's earlobes are able to expand to a length of about 6 meters and they are also surprisingly strong. Jiro can use them to actually pick up objects and even to pierce through strong materials like concrete. Thanks to a wide variety of special equipment and support items, she has been able to enhance her offensive capabilities. For example, she is now able to plug her jacks into the boots of her hero costume and then amplify the vibrations of her heartbeat in order to create a sound wave that she can direct at an opponent. These sound waves can also be used to counter enemy attacks, like when Jiro uses an attack called Counterbalance to counter the effects of present Mike's sound-based quirk. Jiro can also use special amplifier items on her forearms to create a powerful vibration that causes the ground itself to shatter. An attack known as Heartbeat Distortion. Once again, this is accomplished by plugging her jacks into the amplifier items and then channeling and amplifying the vibration of her heartbeat through these items. Jiro eventually learns to use her amplifying equipment in such a way that it sends powerful sound waves directly at her opponents, and her other named moves include Heartbeat Surround, Legato, and Heartbeat Wall. So overall, Jiro's quirk can be quite useful and versatile, although it does rely heavily on support items. In addition, if Jiro overuses her quirk, her ears will begin to bleed. And because Earphone Jack is a mutant type quirk that is literally a part of Jiro's physical body, if the earlobes were physically damaged, then Jiro wouldn't be able to use her quirk anymore.
Next, let's talk about the student who occupies seat number 13, the flex tape Spider-Man himself, Hanta Cero, also known as the taping hero Cellophane. Cero has a mutant type quirk called tape, and it enables him to eject sticky tape from his elbows. This tape can be extremely long, and it sticks to the surfaces it touches. The tape is also extremely strong, and it can be used to restrain opponents, support Sero's own weight and the weight of others, rapidly climb buildings and other objects, and generally to move around like a flex tape Spider-Man. The amount of tape that Sero can generate is not unlimited, and he has to train hard in order to increase the amount of tape that he can use, as well as the strength and speed of the tape itself. Cero takes full advantage of the long-range capabilities of his quirk by firing tape from a distance at his opponents, hitting them with the tape, and then wrapping the tape around them in order to restrain them. He has developed great aim over the course of his training, and he can even fire multiple strands of tape at the same time. He can also produce double-sided tape that sticks on both sides, and that can be used to create sticky traps for opponents. Because of its versatility, Tape is a great work to use in combination with other quirks as part of a team battle. And we've seen both Minata and Ochako making use of Sero's tape in combination with their own quirks. Sero has a couple of named moves, including Barricade Tape, which involves them surrounding an entire area with tape to protect the area itself from surprise enemy attacks. And there's also Trident, which involves Sero grabbing objects with his tape and then throwing them at his opponent. Trident is especially effective when used in combination with Ochako's quirk, because she can use zero gravity to allow Cero to launch incredibly heavy objects like boulders that he would never have been able to pick up otherwise. As is the case with many quirks, tape does have some drawbacks if it is overused. In Cero's case, over-ejecting his tape will lead to dry skin. On top of that, while Cero's tape is certainly sturdy, it is not unbreakable, and a strong opponent can simply cut or break through it. In seat number 14, we have the legendary Feathered Batman, the Emo Bird Boy, the Chicken of Darkness, Fumikage Tokoyami. Okay, his official hero name is the Jet Black Hero Tsukuyomi, but I prefer Chicken of Darkness. Tokoyami's quirk is called Dark Shadow, and it is a long-range emitter type quirk. This quirk basically gives you access to a stand from JoJo's, by which I mean that a bird-like monster that seems to be formed from shadows appears out of the user's own body. Even though this creature looks like a shadow, it has a real physical presence, and it can do some real physical damage. The creature is sentient and even capable of speaking. It is permanently attached to its host Tokoyami, and it protects him from harm. It also obeys his orders, at least most of the time. Although the creature known as Dark Shadow is always connected to Tokoyami's body, it is also able to extend itself far beyond his body, it has its own senses and sensations separate from the host body, and it can even speak telepathically with its host. It possesses immense physical power, and it is also highly resistant, which means that it can be used both for attacking an opponent and for shielding the host against attacks. Later on in the story, and thanks to the guidance of Hawks, Tokoyami figures out a way to use Dark Shadow to essentially fly through the air, which greatly boosts his maneuverability. The power of Dark Shadow is weakened by the presence of light, and quirks that work on the basis of light are more effective against it. At the same time though, when there is no light present, like during the night, Dark Shadow becomes much bigger and stronger. At times like this, it is even prone to going berserk, especially if Tokoyami is feeling intense emotions that he is struggling to control. But although berserk mode Dark Shadow can be difficult to control, it is also much, much stronger than it is during the day. And this is no understatement. Berserk mode Dark Shadow is easily one of the strongest quirks in the entire series. Dark Shadow has a whole bunch of named ultimate moves, including Black Abyss, Piercing Twilight Claws, Black Fallen Angel, Sabbath, Fleeting Blow, and more. I can't talk about them all because if I do, we'll be here forever. But it is important to note that a move called Ragnarok appears to allow Tokoyami to use Dark Shadow in its overpowered Berserker form without losing control of it. Throughout the series, Tokoyami has worked extremely hard to train his quirk and better control his power, and towards the end of the series, all that hard work really starts to pay off. Seat number 15 belongs to Shoto Todoroki, 
the son of number one pro hero Endeavor, and the user of an extremely unique quirk called Half Cold, Half Hot. His hero name is literally just Shoto, so yeah, let's just call him Shoto. Shoto's quirk is a unique mix of his parents' quirks, and because his mother has a powerful ice-based quirk and his father has a powerful fire-based quirk, Shoto was born with the ability to generate both ice and fire. Specifically, the right side of his body can create ice, frost, and extreme cold, while the left side of his body can produce fire, flames, and heat. Shoto's quirk is therefore the perfect marriage of ice and fire, which makes it rare, powerful, and extremely versatile. At first, Shoto only wanted to use the ice side of his quirk because he had a very poor relationship with his father and he didn't want anything to do with his father or his father's quirk. He actually tried to suppress his fire-based powers and focus only on the ice powers instead. Thankfully, Shoto did eventually reconcile with both his father and the fire side of his quirk and he then started using his fire-based powers. It took him a while to get used to actually using the fire side of his quirk, and he spent a lot of time trying to alternate between ice and fire in order to gain full control of both aspects of his quirk. Shoto has a resistance to both extreme cold and extreme heat, and eventually he learns to use the two sides of his quirk so well that he can actually combine both into a single attack. Shoto developed a technique called Phosphor, which enables him to channel both fire and ice throughout his entire circulatory system and fuse the two halves of his quirk into a single ability. He is then able to create a unique form of flame known as Cold Fire, which allows him to both burn and freeze his opponents at the same time. The move also has defensive capabilities, as it can repel other attacks using its unique combination of ice and heat. Even before he learns to combine them, both sides of Shoto's quirk are extremely strong, and I won't go into all of his feats here because it would take a long time to cover it all. Suffice it to say that with his ice side, he can instantly generate entire waves and walls of ice that can freeze entire buildings in seconds. With his fire side, he can create massive walls of flame and heat so intense that it can literally melt steel. Initially, overusing his ice side would drastically lower the temperature in that side of his body and cause frostbite and other injuries. And overusing his fire side would make that side of his body too hot, causing overheating and exhaustion. Luckily, Shoto's commitment to training both sides of his quirk eventually allows him to use fire and ice to balance each other out, reducing the negative effects of both fire and ice on his body. Shoto is another one of those characters with too many named ultimate moves to cover in detail. Basically, they're all really strong, and the more that the story progresses, the stronger they become. Also, the more Shoto learns to use both sides of his quirk at the same time, the more his ultimate moves begin fusing fire and ice-based powers. Then we have Toru Hagakure, also known as the stealth hero Invisible Girl, who sits in seat number 16. Her quirk is called Invisibility, and the name is pretty self-explanatory. It is a mutant-type quirk that renders the user's entire body invisible, and it cannot be turned off. Toru's quirk is obviously great for moving around undetected, whether you want to sneak up on an enemy, spy on them, or just complete secret missions without being seen. That said, for Toru to be completely invisible, she has to be completely naked, because any clothes that she puts on will be visible on her body. Toru's quirk also has the ability to manipulate light, which suggests that the entire quirk may function on the basis of light manipulation. In short, her body automatically refracts light in a way that hides her appearance to the naked eye. Using light manipulation, Toru can use her invisible body as a magnifying lens of sorts, which allows her to warp the light around her into bright sparks that can temporarily blind people. This move is called Warp Refraction. She can also use her body to redirect other light-based attacks, such as for example Aoyama's Naval Laser. Due to both her invisibility and her ability to redirect light, Toru can be an extremely useful part of a hero team. The fact that she has to be completely naked to be invisible means that Toru can't really wear protective gear, so she is vulnerable to being hurt if she finds herself on dangerous terrain, or if she finds herself in extreme temperature conditions like scorching heat or freezing cold. On top of that, if she is hit by a visible substance such as paint, her silhouette will then be revealed and she will no longer be invisible. For most of the series, we had no idea what Toru actually looked like because she was always invisible. 
But we did eventually get a partial face reveal in chapter 337 of the manga. We then got a full face reveal on the cover of chapter 368. In seat number 17, we have the great explosion murder god Dynamite himself, although he's sometimes referred to as Katsuki Bakugo. Bakugo's emitter type quirk is called Explosion, and it enables him to produce a special type of sweat from his palms that has properties similar to nitroglycerin. Essentially, instead of normal sweat, Bakugo produces an explosive liquid, and he uses it to create explosions of different sizes and intensities. The explosions are extremely powerful, and they deal a great deal of damage to both opponents and structures. Fortunately for Bakugo, he himself is immune to the effects of his own explosion, so he doesn't have to worry about blowing himself up by accident. The explosions become stronger the more that Bakugo sweats, so his quirk can actually become more powerful during a longer and more challenging battle. The more intense the battle becomes, the more Bakugo will sweat as a result, which for him is actually an asset. Explosion can be effective at both close range and long range, and it has a lot going for it beyond its impressive offensive capabilities. For example, Bakugo can actually use his explosions to propel himself through the air, and in general he can use the explosions to increase the speed and efficacy of his movements. Due to the explosive nature of his quirk, Bakugo does have to be careful about collateral damage. It is very easy for his explosions to get out of control and do unintended damage to the surrounding area. Bakugo's hero costume, and especially his Grenadier Bracer's support items, allow him to have better control of his explosions while also making them stronger and more intense. These items enable Bakugo to store his sweat in very specific doses, which means that he can produce overpowered explosions without losing control of them and without hurting others. Bakugo is another character with way too many moves to cover individually, but it's important to note that Bakugo is very creative with his quirk, and he has developed a large number of effective combat tactics using his quirk's abilities. Bakugo can do a super-powered Naruto run propelled by his explosions, or he can do a large direct blast, or he can do multiple large or small blasts, he can do scattered blasts that are weaker and concentrated blasts that are stronger, he can use his explosions to propel himself into the air and then attack his opponent with mid-air bombardments, and much, much more. His most recent ultimate move is called Howitzer Impact Cluster, and it is his most powerful attack yet. With the help of a new support item called Strafe Panzer, Bakugo uses his explosions to launch himself upwards and then spin himself through the air. After that, he unleashes a massive barrage of explosions that spray devastation all around him, turning the battlefield into a freaking war zone. Imagine like a tornado made of explosions, and that's kind of what it is. Next up is seat number 18, where we find the one and only Izuku Midoriya, aka Deku. Deku was born quirkless, but he wanted desperately to become a hero, even though he didn't stand much of a chance in a world where about 80% of the population had a quirk. Having a quirk is obviously a huge advantage to anyone trying to become a hero, and so Deku was a massive underdog. But he got lucky because he met Toshinori Yagi, aka All Might, and All Might became convinced that Deku was the perfect person to inherit his quirk, one for all. One for All is a special quirk that can be transferred from one person to another, and the transfer can happen only if the current user willingly allows the new user to consume some of their DNA. After Deku eats a strand of All Might's hair, he becomes the ninth user of One for All. One for All is an emitter type quirk that was created by the fusion of a powerful stockpiling quirk and another quirk which allowed its user to transfer it onto someone else. The stockpiling ability allows the user to build up incredible amounts of power in their body, and this gives them superhuman strength, speed, durability, and agility. What makes All For One extra strong is the fact that it has been transferred from one person to another over the course of many decades. And with each new user, more power was stockpiled inside the quirk. And so, One For All is much stronger now than it was initially, and it just keeps getting stronger. This stockpiled power can be spread out evenly throughout the body, or it can be focused into a specific body part, like your arm when you're punching or your leg when you're kicking. Now, because the user has so much power available to them, they first need to train intensely in order to learn to control the quirk. At first, Deku would severely injure himself every time he tried to use his quirk, and we're talking serious injuries like broken bones. 
It was only after undergoing rigorous training under the mentorship of both All Might and Gran Torino that Deku learned to control the percentage of power he was using when he activated One For All. And this helped keep him out of the hospital. At least sometimes, because let's face it, he does still end up in the hospital a lot. Another thing that makes One For All truly unique is that the vestiges and quirk factors of all its former users are still contained within the quirk. And after a while, Deku learns to actively communicate with the vestiges of all the former users. They are then able to guide him as he works on fully mastering the One For All quirk. In fact, Deku eventually becomes the first One For All user in history to gain the ability to unlock the quirks of all the former users. And so he goes from being quirkless to inheriting One For All, to then unlocking six other quirks in addition to One For All. The quirks that once belonged to the former users of the One For All quirk. These additional quirks include Black Whip, which lets Deku generate black tendrils from his body and then use them to attack or restrain an opponent. Float, which allows him to levitate through the air. Smoke Screen, which enables him to generate smoke all around him. Danger Sense, which is a lot like a spidey sense, and it lets him identify threats in the surrounding area. Fa Jin, which allows him to build up kinetic energy and release superhuman bursts of strength and speed. And finally, Gear Shift, which allows him to shift the speed of anything he touches, literally defying the laws of physics. Now, of course, these are just quick summaries of what the quirks do, and there is a lot more that can be said about each of them. In fact, I would need an entire 30 plus minute video to break down all of Deku's different quirks and all of the former users of One For All. Thankfully, I already made that 30 plus minute video, so if you want to deep dive into One For All and its former users, I will link that video in the description and in the pinned comment, so feel free to check it out. The main power of the quirk All For One is to steal the quirks of others, and the villain All For One has been trying to steal One For All for many, many generations. But because One For All can only be transferred with the current user's consent, All For One has always failed in his attempt to steal it. This makes One For All an incredibly precious weapon in the multi-generational battle to stop All For One. Unsurprisingly, One For All has way too many named moves and we can't talk about them all individually. Although many of them are named after US states or cities, and they are often directly related to how much of One For All's full power is being released. Again, if you want a more detailed breakdown of One For All, check out my full video on it, link in the description. In seat number 19, we have best boy Minoru Mineta, you know, the guy who throws sticky grape-shaped balls from his head. The name of his quirk is Pop-Off, and it is a mutant type quirk that works at medium range. Basically, Mineta produces sticky purple balls on his head, and he can rip them off and throw them at people and things. The balls will stick to anything except for Mineta's own body. They actually bounce off of his body. And as soon as he rips one ball off his head, a new one will replace it right away. Mineta can use his quirk to make his opponents stick to something or to each other, essentially trapping them in place. Because the balls bounce off of Mineta's body instead of sticking to it, he can actually use the balls as mini trampolines to increase his own speed and maneuverability. So if he places a ball on the ground and then jumps directly on it, he will bounce high up into the air. And if he places a bunch of balls on the ground in front of him, then he can bounce from one ball to the other with great speed and agility. He can also attach a bunch of balls to each other in order to create bigger traps, and he can even stick them one on top of the other to create a whip of sorts that he can then use on the battlefield. This move is called Mineta Beads, because of course it is, and it is one of the several named ultimate moves that he possesses. Others include Grape Rush, which involves Mineta rushing an enemy while throwing a bunch of balls at them, Super Grape Rush, which involves him launching a large number of balls from the air at an opponent below, Vineyard, which involves Mineta attaching a rope to his balls in order to create a snare, man, that did not come out right, Grape Buckler, which involves Mineta making a powerful shield by sticking a bunch of his balls together, and Grape Pinky Combo Mineta Bounce, a combo move between Mineta and Mina Ashido. Mineta's quirk is clearly the strongest in all of Class 1A, but it does have a few weaknesses. The level of stickiness is dependent on Mineta's own health, and the stickiness can last anywhere from a few hours to an entire day. Also, if Mineta pops too many balls from his head in a short period of time, he starts bleeding from his scalp. 
And finally, after best boy Minata, we have best girl Momo Yaoyoruzu, the class vice representative who sits in seat number 20. Momo has an emitter type quirk called creation that allows her to create objects from any part of her body. And these objects can include anything from basic weapons and tools to sophisticated cannons and missiles. No matter how complex an object is, Momo is able to create it as long as she understands the atomic structure of the object. She just needs to imagine the parts that are required to make it, then the raw materials that are required to construct it, and finally the coating. The objects can emerge anywhere on Momo's skin, but she needs to keep the skin bare, meaning she can't cover up that part of her skin with clothing. Creation functions by breaking down Momo's fat on a molecular level and reusing it as materials that form the objects she creates. So, Momo's ability to keep creating objects depends on how much fat she has stored up inside her body, meaning that she has to eat a huge amount of food in order to use her quirk effectively. But if she does have enough fat stored up, Momo has the ability to create massive objects, even objects that are bigger than her own body, such as a fully functioning catapult. Although getting to this point took training and commitment, Momo's creations are generally considered to be flawless copies of the originals. Due to the absolutely incredible versatility of her quirk, Momo is able to fight at close range, mid range and long range. All she has to do is create a suitable weapon or tool for the range in question and since she can make everything from a short sword to a cannon, she doesn't have to worry about range related limitations. But although creation is incredibly powerful and versatile, and it is easily one of the best quirks ever in my opinion, it is not without some drawbacks. Momo does need time to create objects, and so having to fight suddenly without prep time makes things more difficult. This is especially the case with producing more complex objects, because their creation requires more time than the creation of simple objects. And as I mentioned earlier, Momo needs to have a strong understanding of the atomic composition of everything she creates, and she needs to have enough fat stored up in her body in order to create that object. Overusing her quirk can lead her to becoming too weak and frail to continue fighting. Momo has a named ultimate move called Yaoyoruzu's Lucky Bag. And this involves Momo creating a cannon that shoots out a bag that contains a bunch of useful support items that her allies can use in battle. And this move really showcases what a great asset Momo's quirk can be in any team situation. Momo's exceptional intelligence, impressive strategic ability and incredible quirk make her one of the best team players in all of MHA. And she demonstrated her ability to work effectively with other heroes and hero students multiple times throughout the series. The scene in which she and a bunch of heroes and hero students attempt to stop a raging Gigantomachia by putting him to sleep is probably the single best example of this. And that is it. All 20 quirks from class 1A explained with updated information all the way up to the final arc of the story. Needless to say, this video turned out to be far longer than the 13 minute video on all the quirks that we made over 5 years ago when there was far less information available about the quirks themselves. Thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to check out my detailed breakdown of One For All and all its former users and their quirks, link in the description. If you made it this far into the video, then congratulations, you just heard me say over 10,000 words. Yes, that is how long this video turned out to be, but I really hope that having all of this information here in one place will be useful to you. If it is, then please leave a like and comment right now to help me out with that YouTube algorithm. And if you are one of the over 50% of people who watch our videos but haven't taken the time to subscribe yet, please do me a quick favor and subscribe to Anime Uproar right now. Subscribing on YouTube is completely free, but it helps me out a lot. And if you really want to do me a solid, you can also hit that bell and select the option that says all. That's like an additional piece of insurance that you won't miss our future videos because YouTube refuses to recommend them to you. Thanks again for your time, your support, your likes and comments, and until next time, see ya, space cowboys.